uh, as Olivia comes up, I hope. Olivia, I haven't seen you. Here we are. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, we're going to be reading from verse 18 to 25. Morning, church. As my dad said, 225, not just verse 18. Um, will you follow along with me? Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being just a man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. And I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often called. He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He saves are His delight Christ will hold me fast Precious in His holy sight He will hold me fast He'll not let my soul be lost His promises shall last Bought by Him at such a cost he will hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When He comes at last He will hold me fast He will hold me fast 
for my Savior loves me so, and He will hold me fast, and He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, and He will hold me fast. Thank you. Please sit down. Uh, shall I pray for us? Heavenly Father, thank you that you have promised to hold us fast. Thank you that even when we struggle, and especially when we struggle and face hardships, you hold us fast, and we can rest assured in your great love and faithfulness. Now, as we turn to the Bible, uh, as we consider the meaning of Christmas, we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would speak to us through your word. Amen. Now, uh, you will know, perhaps, that in Anglican circles, and our church falls under the Anglican umbrella, you will know that in Anglican circles, uh, the month leading up to Christmas is called Advent. Um, Advent uh, comes from the Latin word Adventus, which apparently... Uh, I'm not sure, but apparently it means coming. Uh, so it's a time for us to remember the first coming of Christ and also to prepare ourselves for the second coming of Christ. Uh, so we ask ourselves, for instance, are we living in the profound reality of Christ's first coming? And we ask ourselves, are we checking our beliefs and behavior in the sure fact of Christ's second coming. That's what Advent is for. Our new Christmas series starting today is called The Quest for Christmas. Uh, and so for the next few weeks, we're going to listen uh, to some key role players in the Bible in our quest, in our search, in our hunt to find the meaning of Christmas. We're going to look at some accounts from the first few chapters of Matthew's gospel um, to help us. And today, we're going to look at the gospel uh, according to an angel. Uh, Matthew records the account of an angel that is a messenger of God appearing to Joseph and telling him some things. And from that, we can learn much. Now, uh, you may not be a Christian. You may not be convinced of the truth of the Bible. You may think it is a, a myth or a legend, um, and I trust that you uh, and we will find this morning's sermon helpful. May I ask you, uh, as, we, as we meet now and listen to the Bible, may I ask you, what is your greatest need at the moment? What is your greatest need? Is it electricity? Is it gas? Because you forgot to refill. Is it that your team wins the World Cup? Perhaps if you're a teenager, it's Wi-Fi. That's your greatest need. Or perhaps the, we can think more deeply. Maybe our, you would consider our greatest need at the moment political stability. Or family harmony. Perhaps you're dreading Christmas lunch when you meet with those other family members. Maybe it's finances. Maybe health. Maybe friendship. It's been a very lonely year. And friendship is your greatest need. Or a sense of purpose. Or wisdom for the future. Perhaps a holiday is your greatest need, and you're just trying to make it and keep it together to, towards Christmas. Well, all these things are very important, and all these things are, are necessary. We all need a holiday from time to time. We all need Wi-Fi from time to time. Family harmony is a good thing. These are all good things. But hundreds of years ago, an angel told Joseph that the child to be born would deal with our very greatest need. And once that need is dealt with, all our other needs for Wi-Fi and friends and family 
all our other needs find their appropriate place in our lives once we have that great need met. So number one, as we come to God's word, number one, we see extraordinary grace. Now note how Matthew starts his book about Jesus with a genealogy in chapter one, if you have your Bibles with you. Now to us, genealogies are quite boring. Uh, we, we would put genealogies in the footnote or in the appendix at the back of the book. But in that culture, in Matthew's day, genealogies were really riveting reading. He puts it in the first chapter of his book, uh, the, the ancestry of Jesus. And he does that because he, Matthew knows that this is extremely important. You see, in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, uh, God had promised to save people from all over the world through a descendant of Abraham. And also in the Old Testament, God had promised that this Savior would be a great king whose throne would last forever, and he would be born in the royal line of David. And so Matthew starts his gospel with Jesus' ancestry. And chapter 1, verse 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and Christ, me, Christ means anointed one, that means king. This is how he starts his book. The book of the gen, genealogy of Jesus the king, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That is, Matthew is going to show us that this Jesus, the man, is the promised savior, the promised king from God, who is going to save people from all over the world. And as you read the genealogy, a couple of startling, astonishing names pop out at you. For instance, in verse 3, Tamar is the seductive daughter-in-law who deceives and sleeps with her father-in-law. Now, if I was writing the Bible, I wouldn't put that name in there. In verse 5, Rahab's name is there. She's a streetwise prostitute. Also in chapter 5, the name of Ruth. Now, Ruth was from Moab, and no one likes people from Moab because they were the enemies of God's people in the Old Testament. In verse 6, listen to how, he's, how Matthew describes David. Verse 6, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Wow. The wife of Uriah was Bathsheba, who, who David committed adultery with, possibly against her will. And then David, the king, had Uriah, the husband, Bathsheba's husband, put in the front lines of battle and killed. And Matthew highlights this by calling Bathsheba the, the wife of Uriah in Jesus' ancestry. Why does Matthew put out all these startling names in his book? Well, Matthew wants to remind us, God wants to re remind us that the Bible is not full of perfect people. The Bible... And this is good news. The Bible is full of people just like me and you. Weak, broken sinners whose lives aren't together who needs God's grace. Look at verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called king. That is, the eternal God, the Son, came into our world in the person of Jesus, and he was born through Mary, an ordinary peasant girl from some backwater town, a very ordinary girl. See, that this, this genealogy is full of surprising people and ordinary people, just like our genealogies and our ancestries would be if we tracked them. By the way, if you're interested in tracking genealogies, Gordon tells me that he's related to the captain of the Titanic. So Gordon is definitely not going to be in charge of our life-saving ministries at the next church camp. <laughs> Matthew tells us that Jesus is the descendant of Abraham, born in the royal line of David, qualified to be king and savior of the world. But more than that, Matthew tells us by Jesus' ancestry 
something else. He tells us that this gospel that Jesus is bringing, this news that Jesus is bringing, is bringing can save and use and include and welcome even people that the world would condemn, even people we might not think are good enough, even people who feel terrible about themselves and think they are beyond God's grace. Matthew tells us the gospel is for them. Uh, so extraordinary grace. Maybe you think you've blown it. Maybe you think you are beyond God's grace. The Bible will tell you this morning, no, you're not. Because God would love to use you and welcome you into his family. Extraordinary grace. That's what the gospel of Jesus is about. That's what Christmas is all about. Secondly, extraordinary conception. Look at verse 18. And now it says, now the birth of Jesus the king took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, just you would expect the birth of God's promised king uh, and savior, you would expect his birth to be extraordinary, especially if this king would be God with us, we'd expect an extraordinary birth, and so it was. Mary was pregnant before she had sexual union with Joseph. That doesn't happen very often, I'm told. In fact, it only happened once in all of history. And how did Mary fall pregnant? Well, Matthew tells us that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and miraculously, mysteriously, extraordinarily, the child was conceived. And you may ask, is this not a fairy tale? Is this not myth, legend? Does this kind of thing really happen in the world? Well, we would answer you by saying, if God created the entire universe, seen and unseen, out of nothing, then God can do anything he wants. And so this is recorded for us as history, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit God the Son entered our world. Notice uh, verse 16 in the gene genealogy. It says, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called king. Now, all through the gene genealogy, you will notice that the phrase, the father of, is repeated. The father of, the father of, the father of, the father of, the father of. But this stops when we get to Joseph, and Joseph is not called the father of Jesus. He's called the husband of of Mary, because he was not Jesus' father, biological father. God the Father entered our world through God the Son, and a virgin conceived. Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born. Jesus did not start existing when he was conceived. By the way, the eternal God, the Son, who reigns and rules from eternity past, simply entered our world at the conception and incarnation, and he will continue to reign and rule forever. God, the Son, entered our world at that first Christmas. Now, can you imagine the conversation? I can't. Uh, Mary saying to Joseph, Joseph, I'm pregnant, but I haven't slept with anyone. It's from God. And Joseph's like, you're right. I wasn't born yesterday. Verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put it to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, of course, Mary and Joseph were not married. They were engaged. They were betrothed. Uh, in Jewish custom, engagement, betrothal, was a very serious commitment. Uh, while you still lived apart, so you lived in separate homes, uh, but you were actually viewed as pre-married. That is, uh, it was a binding legal commitment. And if you wanted to break off your engagement, your betrothal, you had to get legally separated. So for Mary to fall pregnant before she was officially married, and in this period of betrothal, for her to fall pregnant would have been a massive disgrace in that culture. And so Joseph wanted to spare the embarrassment, and so he decided, uh, because he was a kind, just person, he decided to get separated, divorced, quietly, privately, so no one would know the disgrace. Of course, let me just say that God knows that sexual union is best in a committed marriage, 
and sexual union outside of marriage, uh, outside of marriage can cause great harm and hurt, but it's not the unforgivable sin. And God's grace is extraordinary and he restores and, and helps. And children are a gift from God. Anyway, Joseph wants to break off his engagement, verse 20. But as he considered these things, how he's going to break up, in other words. Um, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, this angel appears to Joseph to explain what's happening. Uh, the Bible teaches that there are such things as angels. They are messengers of God. Uh, they are spiritual beings. They largely operate in the unseen world. They carry out the commands and decrees of God. We don't know too much about them, actually. Uh, Luke, in his gospel, tells us that this was actually the archangel Gabriel who appeared to Joseph. And Gabriel, the angel, says to Joseph, don't break the engagement. Mary is telling the truth. That child is conceived by the Holy Spirit. It will, that child will be unique and different and set apart and unlike any other human being that has ever walked the face of this planet. Extraordinary conception. Thirdly, we see extraordinary mission. The angel goes on to say something very important. The angel says the true meaning for the coming of Jesus. And so as we as a church consider the quest for Christmas, here is it, here it is, here is the reason for Christmas, verse 21 in the angel's message. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, Mary and Joseph uh, don't um, get to decide on Jesus' name, thank goodness, because you know how much arguing that causes. Or maybe it was just for us. Uh, Mary and Joseph don't get to decide on Jesus' name. Um, God the Father decided. And the angel communicates what God the Father has decided. But Mary and Joseph get to give him the name that's been decided, Jesus. And by the way, give, Joseph giving him the name, that shows that Joseph legally adopted Jesus. Uh, and so Jesus would be in the royal line of David, just as his father Joseph was. But why the name Jesus? Well, Jesus literally means he saves. As the angel goes on to explain, for he, and the emphasis is, is on the he. The angel says, for he, he and no other person in all the world will save his people from their sins. You see, and it is in this announcement that we find our greatest need. We may think that our greatest need is Wi-Fi or electricity or friendship or meaning. And all those things are very important. But the Bible says that, I, that our greatest need as human beings is that we are saved from our sins. You see, we stand guilty and condemned before a holy God because of our sin and because of our self-rule. We stand uh, condemned and guilty and we need to be saved. Now, I remember, uh, I'll never forget the first time I went to the principal's office in primary school. Uh, I was in a Paul Boys Primary and there was a big rule that said you may not run in the passageways. And I was running in a passageway and I was caught and I was sent, uh, I was running at break time and the prefect sent me to the principal's office. So there I stood for the rest of break time, guilty and condemned, a sinner outside the principal's office waiting for the just punishment which I received uh, from the principal. You know, God... God is not a principle. He's not an angry old man in heaven. But the Bible describes God as the Holy One of Israel. That is, he is the set-apart one, the pure one, 
the one who is not like us, the one who is without sin. He is the Holy One of Israel. And we stand condemned before the Holy One because we are not holy. We are unholy. We have sinned against God. We, we try and run our own lives. We break his law. And we stand like I stood all those many years ago. We stand guilty and condemned, but not before a principal of a primary school. Who cares about that? We stand guilty and condemned before the Holy One of Israel. And we deserve the just punishment. And the Bible tells us that the just punishment is hell forever abandoned by God. And that is terrible news. I, I don't even want to say it. I don't even want to think about it. But the Bible says if you offend or hold the Holy One of Israel, the only just punishment can be eternity apart from his presence. And a, and in, and a place that is imp, uh, where there is no good apart from all that is good and apart from God must be described as hell. And that's how Jesus described it. Because of our sin and our self-rule. You see, we deserve the just punishment, but the Bible tells us that God in his great love, God the Father sends God the Son into our world to die in our place and at the cross receive the just punishment for me and for you so that you and I can be forgiven and we can be saved forever from our sins. What is the meaning of Christmas? Why did Jesus come into the world? Well, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus would do it at the cross. Now notice the priority of God's grace here. He will save his people. The angel didn't say, you'll call him Jesus because he's going to show you how you can save yourself. No, we can't save ourselves. We're not good enough for God. Even our best is not good enough for God. He, he and he alone, there's no one else in this world, in all of world history that can save. Only he can save. And he will do it. If you put your faith and trust in him. My greatest need is not riches or Wi-Fi or a new car or lots of friends or a great life. My greatest need is the reason why Jesus came, that my sins and your sins can be forgiven, that you can be God's friend forever. Extraordinary mission, that's why Jesus came. Fourthly and lastly, extraordinary fulfillment. Now, Matthew in his book reminds us uh, that the coming of Jesus was not random, was not last minute, but a fulfillment of centuries of, uh, of centuries of God's dealings with his people. So look at verse 22. Matthew writes, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And now he quotes from Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, lived 700 years before Christ. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, just two things to note here. Number one, notice what Matthew says before he quotes from Isaiah in the Old Testament. Matthew says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken. And then he quotes from the Bible. In other words, to Matthew... And to Jesus, by the way, the Bible is God's word spoken. If you want to know what God says, you don't have to climb Mount Everest, thankfully. just have to open your Bibles. Because the Bible contains God's word. And therefore, my dear friend, don't discard the Bible as irrelevant and out of touch. Open it. Read it and ask God to give you understanding of his word, and God will do it. The, the Bible is not a random book. It's God's word, and 700 years before Christ, um, he had spoken of a virgin giving birth. Number two, if you read Isaiah chapter 7, which was written all those years back, you will discover 
that the sign of a virgin giving birth is not a good sign, interestingly enough. Isaiah says, when the virgin is pregnant and gives birth to a son, you better watch out because judgment is around the corner. In fact, when a virgin is pregnant and gives birth, it's a dangerous time, says Isaiah. Because why? Because God is with us. And God being with us is a very, very dangerous thing. If the Holy One, in, if the Holy One of Israel is with you, it can be very dangerous if you're not on his sign. You see, God with us is only good news if you are on God's side. If you're not on God's side, it's bad news. If you're not on God's side, Christmas is bad news because that means judgment is imminent just around the corner because you still have to bear the punishment for your sins. And if you are, if you are far from God, if you don't like God, if you don't want to submit yourself to God, you don't really want Christmas, do you? Because Christmas reminds us that God is with us. But if you've, if you've acknowledged your sin and self-rule and say, God, forgive me, I trust in you, I submit to your son, then Christmas is good news because God has come close to you in the person of Jesus and has saved you. Extraordinary fulfillment. Well, how should we respond to all of these things? Well, be like Joseph. Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did all that the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called him, he named him Jesus. See, Joseph, what did Joseph do? Joseph obeyed. And that's what we are called to do as, as, as people. God the Father sent God the Son into our world to save us. And now he commands all people everywhere to turn from sin and self-rule. And that's, uh, that's simply saying, God, I'm not God. I'm not going to run my own life. You are God. You've sent your Son. I'm going to submit to him. I'm going to trust him to save me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Christ died for me and I come to him as Lord and King. And when you do that, you might not get free Wi-Fi. You might not get that holiday in Zanzibar. You might not get loads of friends, but you know what you will get? You will get your sins forgiven forever. You'll be saved and you will be part of God's family, not only in this world, but in the new world to come. Isn't that a great thing? Who cares about electricity when you can have that? Well, we all care about electricity. But in comparison, what is our greatest need? Well, we need to be saved. So we pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider the quest for Christmas this month, we pray that you'd help us, each one, wherever we find ourselves this morning, help us, each one, to listen to the angel's message and to take it on board. Help us to follow Joseph's, Joseph's example of obedience and not try and run our own lives anymore but to submit ourselves to your King and say thank you, Jesus, for dying on a cross to save me from my sins. Help me to follow you as best I can from today. And even if you think that you are too far gone, you definitely aren't. And even if you think you've messed up too badly, you definitely haven't, because God's grace is extraordinary and it's extended to you and me also. Amen.